The Second World War had initiated a time of tremendous economic prosperity in Newfoundland and Labrador. This in turn sparked calls for political change. Since 1934, the country had been administered by a commission of government. Its members were not elected by the people. They were appointed by Britain. The commission came into power during a period of tremendous economic and political instability. Scandal plagued the House of Assembly, and deep public debt threatened to force the country into bankruptcy. The commission was seen by the Newfoundland and British governments as a temporary measure to solve these problems. It would remain in power until two conditions were met. First, Newfoundland should be once again self-supporting. And second, there should be a demand from the people for a restoration of responsible government. But just how that demand should be made was not specified. Nonetheless, as Newfoundland's economy rebounded during the Second World War, it was widely assumed that the commission of government would be replaced once peace was restored. But what form would the new government take? On December 11, 1945, the Newfoundland and British governments announced that a national convention would come together to examine the country's financial situation and recommend possible future forms of government. Then, the voting public would get to choose precisely which form of government would take office in a referendum. But first, the Newfoundland and Labrador people would have to elect the 45 members of the National Convention. Voting began on June 21, 1946. It was the first time Newfoundlanders had gone to the polls in a general election since 1932, and the first time Labrador had ever been included as an electoral district. The convention's first chairman was Judge Cyril Fox, and under his guidance, deliberations began on September 11, 1946. Two months later, Fox unexpectedly died. He was replaced by F. Gordon Bradley, a former member of the Newfoundland House of Assembly, who now represented Bonavista East. The convention set up ten committees to examine various aspects of the country's economy and society. They submitted reports for full discussion and adoption. All of this information was later used by the Finance Committee to create a consolidated report on Newfoundland and Labrador's economic and financial situation. All debates were broadcast over the government radio station VONF. At the beginning, members assumed that they would discuss possible future forms of government only after committee work had been finished. However, this plan was upset on October 28th when Joseph R. Smallwood, the representative for Bonavista Center, moved that the convention should send a delegation to Ottawa to investigate possible terms of union with Canada. Mr. Smallwood. I beg to give leave that I will on tomorrow move the following resolution. Resolved that the National Convention desires to send a delegation consisting of the chairman and six of its members to London for the purpose of ascertaining from His Majesty's government in the United Kingdom what financial or fiscal relationship is possible between that government and Newfoundland under responsible government or commission government modified and unmodified or under any other form of government, and desires to send a delegation consisting of the chairman and six other of its members to Ottawa to ascertain from the government of the Dominion of Canada what fair and equitable basis may exist for federal union of Newfoundland and Canada. Smallwood was one of the few members who openly supported Confederation. His motion found only 17 supporters, but it sparked a bitter debate which polarized the convention. In these circumstances, an impartial assessment of the country's condition and prospects became a near impossibility. In the end, the convention decided to send delegations to London and to Ottawa. Both were led by the chairman, F. Gordon Bradley, who was himself an active Confederate. 
The London delegation was composed mainly of anti-Confederates, and the most vocal was Major Peter Cashin, the representative from St. John's West. Delegates left Newfoundland on April 25, 1947, and had three frosty meetings with a British delegation headed by the Dominion Secretary, Viscount Addison. The British made it clear that if Newfoundland returned to responsible government, it could expect no financial or economic assistance. This unhelpful attitude enraged anti-Confederate leaders, and Cashin made an emotional speech to the convention on May 19th. I say to you that there is in operation at the present time a conspiracy to sell, and I use the word sell advisedly, this country to the Dominion of Canada. I repeat, some people may think I am talking wildly, but I would ask them to remember that long before this, I made statements in this house which were regarded at the time as wild prophecies. But time proved that I was right. All I ask you then to do in the present instance is to watch events develop in the coming two months, then pass your judgment on the statements I make today. Watch in particular the attractive bait which will be held out to lure our country into the Canadian mousetrap. Listen to the flowery sales talk which will be offered you, telling Newfoundlanders they're a lost people, that our only hope, our only salvation, lies in following a new Moses into the promised land across the Cabot Strait. The Ottawa delegation left Newfoundland on June 19th. Its members included Confederates Gordon Bradley and Joseph Smallwood. Bradley told the convention the delegation would be back within a month. However, he and Smallwood had no such intention. Their idea was to stay in Ottawa until they negotiated draft terms of union with the Canadian government. This would allow them to return home with a document that the convention could discuss. They also hoped that a prolonged stay in Ottawa would postpone the referendum from the fall of 1947, as planned, until sometime in 1948. This would give the Confederates more time to campaign. Their strategy succeeded. Draft terms of union were indeed negotiated, and the delegation didn't return until early October. Anti-Confederates were infuriated at this turn of events. Bradley was forced to resign as chairman, although his replacement was another Confederate, John McAvoy. The convention now turned to the final stages of its business. It dealt first with the financial and economic reports prepared by the Finance Committee, which was chaired by Peter Cashin. Both of these were highly optimistic documents. They can be considered anti-Confederate manifestos. Then, Smallwood led the debate on the Ottawa delegation's report and the draft terms of union. These talks lasted for almost two months. Finally, the time came for the convention to recommend which forms of government should appear on the referendum ballot. All members agreed that both responsible government and the continuation of commission of government should be present. On January 23, 1948, Smallwood moved that Confederation with Canada should be a third option. The debate that followed was the climax of the convention. Long and emotional, it didn't end until 5.30 in the morning on January 28th. We Confederates... We're not afraid to let the people decide on responsible government and commission government. We voted to place those two forms on the ballot paper. If the anti-Confederates are not afraid that the people will vote for Confederation, let them vote now tonight to place Confederation on the ballot in the referendum. Come on, let them throw all their excuses out the window and vote for this motion. Let them show us now that they're not afraid to let the people decide on confederation. I dare them to do it. In the end, Smallwood's motion was defeated by 29 votes to 16. The convention dissolved two days later. But Smallwood and Bradley kept up the fight to put Confederation on the ballot. They called the delegates who defeated the motion the 29 dictators. 
They claimed that they had denied the people the right to choose the form of government they wanted. Smallwood and Bradley circulated a petition to the governor demanding that Confederation be included as an option. In just over a week, 44,000 signatures were collected. The British government was sympathetic. In fact, it also supported Confederation. The Second World War had left Britain's economy in ruins, and it was eager to divest itself of colonies. Canada, on the other hand, wanted Newfoundland and Labrador as a province. By the start of the National Convention, both Britain and Canada had come to the joint conclusion that Confederation was desirable, but that they would work behind the scenes to bring it about. Both governments agreed that the final decision would have to come from the voters. On March 11th, the British government announced that it would disregard the National Convention's recommendation and put three choices on the referendum ballot. Responsible government as it existed in 1933, commission of government for a period of five years, and confederation with Canada. Britain justified its decision to include confederation by pointing to the considerable amount of debate it had received in the convention. The date for the referendum was set for June 3, 1948, just three months away. Although the National Convention's recommendation to keep Confederation off the ballot was rejected, it was not an entirely ineffective body. It played an important role as a vehicle of political education for a people who had not voted in a general election for more than a decade. The debates and their extensive coverage on radio and in the newspapers helped to inform the voters about the options available to them in the upcoming referendum. 